In this video segment, I will go over the recovery position for an unconscious victim, control of external bleeding, and uh, burn identification and treatment. The recovery position is used if you have to leave an unconscious victim. For example, uh, when you have to go and make a call, if you cannot summon help by um, shouting for it. Or, or if the victim vomits to prevent the uh, aspiration of the vomit. It generally should not be used if at all if you suspect a spinal injury unless you have to use it to keep the airway open. If you find that the victim is breathing but is unconscious and has no evidence of head, neck, or spine injury, place her in the recovery position. To place the victim to her side, lift the arm on the side the victim will be rolled to above her head. Take the other arm and cross it over the chest. Bend the top leg. Kneel between the shoulders and the hips. Gently roll the victim as a unit in that position. Support the head so that it is angled toward the ground. Nosebleeds, particularly in the Arizona climate, are pretty common. The uh, nasal passages will dry, and particularly in young children people and people who might have a predisposition toward nosebleeds, they're fairly common. Uh, the common misconception was that you pinch the nose and lean the head back, but actually what happens in that is that the blood will have a tendency to run down the throat. Very unpleasant, and you don't want to mess up the breathing or hack or actually get some, some blood down into the passages. So Ian here is going to demonstrate what you should do if you have a nosebleed. He's going to reach up and pinch the nose to apply a form of direct pressure. He's going to lean forward, and what this will do is it'll help keep the blood from ru running down his throat. In addition, you can apply ice packs around the area to slow the blood flow. So the combination is direct pressure, bending forward so the blood does not go down the throat, and then ice packs around the area to slow the flow of blood. Types of wounds, uh, abrasion, avulsion, incision, laceration, and puncture. An abrasion is typically known as a brush burn. Uh, basically the top layer, maybe a little bit into the second layer of skin, has been abraded. And in this case, there's an oozing of the wound, an oozing of the blood, and the lymph fluids. Not a big deal, but still could be infected. Uh, a, a sterile dressing usually is sufficient on it, a Band-Aid, depending on the size of the wound. An avulsion is actually a ripping off of a body part, some, a lot of times incomplete, uh, and this requires a surgical intervention, so it's important to uh, keep the area as clean as possible and get to a medical facility so it can be stitched back on basically. An incision is usually done um, by a very sharp object. It's a very clean cut, very sharp, of varying depths. Uh, if it goes through all the different skin layers, usually uh, stitches or at least sterile strips will be needed to close the wound. Uh, particularly in areas where the skin is stretched pretty tight, uh, for example, the head area, and you know that all head and uh, face wounds will tend to bleed profusely because you have a, a tremendous uh, profusion of um, blood supply to this area. So direct pressure will, will be needed and possibly even a little bit more. Uh, another type of wound is a laceration. This can be of varying skin thickness depths and it's characterized by jagged edges. The last one is the one that bears probably the greatest risk of infection, a puncture wound. This can be caused by any sharp object that can penetrate through multi layers of skin, possibly even into the underlying muscle. Uh, animal bites, uh, stepping on a rusty nail, something like that. And uh, if this is the instance, it should definitely be checked on by a physician, emergency room doctor, because there's a high rate that of infection from that object puncturing in and it's very very hard to clean through all those skin depths that have been punctured. So a tetanus shot is frequently recommended if you have not had one within the last five to ten years. Um, again with a head with a head injury if you've got a cut 
uh, where the skin will gap because it's stretched tightly o over uh, the skull, you definitely should probably get that stitched up. The chance for scarring and infection are pretty high. We're next going to cover a few other different methods of helping you stop bleeding besides direct pressure. There are instances when direct pressure may not be enough to stop bleeding, particularly arterial bleeding, which is indicated by spurting blood. In that instance, there are other methods that you can apply along with direct pressure. For example, let's say that Ian has a, a wound right here in the forearm and arterial bleeding, characterized by some spurting under pressure. So he will hold the direct pressure on the wound with his opposite hand. I will assist by applying elevation and pressure point. Pressure point is where the main artery comes off, off of the uh, heart area and into the limb. And it's in between the bicep and tricep area. You can feel kind of a groove right here. And you know you've got the proper area because the victim will start feeling a tingling sensation in the hand and coming down the arm. So here we have a demonstration of direct pressure applied by Ian on his wound, elevation of the area above heart height, and application of pressure on the pressure point, the brachial artery. Bandaging around a joint area can be kind of problematic. You don't want to have a buildup of material in the area, for example, inside the elbow, or in the case on Ian, if he has a hurt knee, the area behind the knee. So what we can do is what is called a figure eight wrap. And in this, we're, the co common area injured in a fall would be right here. And Ian can help me by putting, by holding that down, uh, we could apply the direct pressure now, a figure eight goes like this. First, you form an anchor. And on that, we go above the area of the wound and make a wrap. You can do a little lock to keep slippage from occurring by making a little tag like that and then going over it. And then we take it across the wound area in a figure eight. There we go. We got it. Now we come below, take a wrap, and then X over it again. We get the ends covered. Holds it pretty securely, and you also note that you do not have a buildup of material behind the knee, which can be quite uncomfortable. And then we can finish it off by doing a secure it under the knee part, okay? And you have a figure eight holding the gauze, sterile gauze, in place. There are three degrees of burns, typically. Uh, in the first level, we're almost all familiar with a mild sunburn. It's a reddening of the skin, uh, maybe a little bit of pain, not necessarily. Um, no real risk of infection because the deeper layers of skin are not involved. Uh, there's uh, different kinds of topical anesthetics can be used, possibly uh, the analgesic of your choice as far as aspirin or Advil, etc. In the second degree, uh, deeper layers of skin have been affected and uh, typically there's a bubbling of the skin, a blistering, and the risk of infection does go up. One thing you do not want to do is break the bubbles the blisters. Um, a sterile dressing, a covering of some kind, uh, maybe all that's needed. It really depends on the area of area um, amount that has been affected. If it's on the air area of the hands, the face, or the genitals, particularly if it's a child or older, older uh, individual, um, it should be seen by a physician. Uh, the, like I said, the risk of infection is up there, and, you, and the blisters will usually typically break. The last one is uh, third degree burn, and this, in, this is an instance where all three layers of skin uh, have been affected. It's deep, it's e possibly even into the muscle. And this is uh, a medical emergency and should be seen an emergency room physician, et cetera, as soon as possible. It's a full, what's called a full thickness burn.